Hello and welcome to Clock Tower Game Studios. Today we're going to be making some scatter terrain for the streets of Neo Nagoya. So I'm starting off with some XPS foam and the idea I've got in my head is I want to build a roadblock or like a um, temporary barricade type bunker, not bunker really, more like emplacement for the police of the recently or evacuation in progress city of Neo Nagoya. So starting with my foam here, I'm going to cut it down into size and make some Jersey barriers or K-rails. Um, for those of you not familiar with the slang or the terminology, uh, those are the road barriers that are used to divide interstates or to help buffer versus traffic for interstate road construction. So with that, we're just gonna start uh, digging in and I'm gonna be doing all my cutting uh, for this piece of the project with a utility knife and my hobby knife. So I don't really have any set measurements here. I'm just basing this on that. I want the barriers to be approximately chest or a little taller on the models around an inch tall total. Uh, and that takes into account their base uh, for the height versus the model. So here I'm just cutting the uh, bottom chunk. That's about the right length that I want. I'm cutting that down to size and that's going to give me approximately a one inch by one inch by around an inch and a half a piece of foam. So the next thing I want to do is I want to make two barriers out of this. So I'm going to cut it in half lengthways and I'm going to use the lines on my cutting mat as my gauge for where to cut it. So I just line that up by eye. It doesn't quite line up very well with the camera, but it did whenever I was eyeballing it from beside, uh, from beside behind the blade. And then I just started my cut and I made kind of a couple sign motions and it doesn't really need to be that clean because we're going to add rock texture. We're going to be trimming it down to a more tapered um, shape overall anyway. So it wasn't a big deal. So the next thing I did is I wanted to clean up those a little bit and make sure they were as close to the same uh, thickness as I could. So I used the thinner one that turned out as a guide and then just kind of cut the other one down carefully. Once I've got it cut down to the uh, thickness I want, I start trying to decide how I want to taper the end. And I decide that I want it to be about half the width at the top that it is at the bottom, but I want the taper to be symmetrical. So here I'm carefully marking on the edges of my foam where I want to make the cuts to make the top narrow. So I'm just using the grid off of my cutting mat. And again, I'm just eyeballing this. It doesn't have to be perfect. Like I said, we're going to be texturing this with uh, some aluminum foil to give it a nice concrete rock texture. And here I'm just kind of drawing in my guideline for where I want to cut. And I'll do that on both ends and I've got the mark on the top edge as well that I'll be using. So I just get that mark in place and then I'm gonna go ahead and start cutting. So here I'm gonna start at the top end, the narrow end, and I'm gonna start cutting down into the material. I'm being careful to stay outside of the line that I want right now and just take off small sections and work down to the taper I want instead of trying to do it all at once. Doing this lets me take more control over it and since I don't really have any guides other than the lines and you know kind of eyeballing it, it really is difficult to get it perfect. So it's just a matter of taking time, making multiple cuts, working it down into the shape that I wanted it to be in and being very careful not to cut myself with the knife because this thing is sharp, the foam is soft. Um, there were times when the blade slipped really easily. And uh, one of the biggest frustrations with this, honestly, uh, other than it's just kind of time consuming, one of the biggest frustrations is the little itty bitty foam scraps are staticky and will cling to everything. And it's really annoying. So, I don't know if maybe there's a way to avoid that, but just it, if you start doing this kind of project yourself, that's definitely something to be aware of. Uh, these little scraps of foam will just go everywhere. So here I've finished both sides and I've started kind of eyeballing it. I'm trying to figure out how else I want to do it. I'm testing it against my model there, the test model, the Infinity old JSA model. I'm using those because they're one of the uh, models I have that's actually more popular and recognizable. So the next thing I want to do is uh, taper the corners, kind of angle them both so they can butt up at more than just uh, blunt 
end to end. I want them to be able to sit to where they're at a 90 degree angle as well. So what I'm doing here is I've got a little miter box that I picked up for cheap at, I believe, Home Depot. And I'm just gonna get it lined up on the edge of the table. And I spent a little time trying to figure out how exactly I wanted to do this. And I found that the way it ended up working out best for me was if I, see, I didn't like the way that one turned out. I ended up trying to take too much of the end off. But the way that ended up working out best for me is I, um, cut, start the cut at the top where the uh, edge, like the top edge meets the tapered edge. So I don't actually cut into the top at all uh, in the finished product. I just cut straight down along that, um, along that edge. And I only cut the part that kind of flares out towards the bottom. I don't actually cut the top edge in the ones I'm happy with. Um, that took a little trial and error to figure out. And here I think you might actually be watching the first one I did where I definitely did cut into the top edge and that like I said that's ideally that that didn't turn out the way I wanted it to and I liked the results of doing them um, from the from that top edge like that vertice where they all meet at the top uh, without actually cutting into that uh, flat surface. So let's chalk that up as the first lesson learned during this build is sometimes the specialty tool isn't the best thing for the job and you're better off just freehanding it with your utility knife. So now I go around all four sides and do the same thing. Uh, as I did it, I got a little better at it a little faster and was able to uh, recognize exactly the shape I was going for. So it went a lot quicker on the second go. And once I've got that done, the next thing to do is add the rock texture. So here I've just got a ball of aluminum foil and I just press it into the surface of the foam. And this creates kind of a rough, uneven, cracked uh, rock texture, just like I want. Um, I probably could have, for concrete, done a couple different approaches. I could have used sandpaper and just pressed it in until the texture transferred. Um, I've tried things like that in the past, and while they do work to a degree, I wanted something a little more visually um, easily recognizable. Uh, I find that some of the fine textures, and that's part of why I do the asphalt the way I do too, some of the really fine textures, they translate well to scale modeling, and they look fine. But when you start messing with wargaming, uh, sometimes it's hard for those to transition and actually be visible. So um, that's why I went with the uh, aluminum foil approach. Now that we've got the K-Rails sorted out, let's talk about the, uh, the base for the whole thing. So I wanted something thin but sturdy that wouldn't warp a lot. So I went and poked around and at Home Depot, I found these samples of granite and other stone countertops. Now this is like a laminate that goes on top of your wood countertop, I'm assuming. I don't know if you can get these as actual full on granite or not. I don't, it doesn't matter. But the samples are free and you can take a bunch of different ones. The only downside is they have a really smooth side that's usually the side that's the finish and then they have a coarse side and then uh, they have a hole in them where they're normally put on like a pegboard for you to look at all of them and figure out which one you want to try. So I took and grabbed one of these uh, out of my pile and I found a manhole cover, as you can see here, that uh, I'd previous, previously made out of cardstock and then made a silicone mold of. Uh, I've done that with some of the bits in here, but most of them are real straightforward how to make them out of, uh, how to make them from scratch. Like I said, that's just two layers of cardstock. I cut a circle, I cut some strips uh, and glued them to the top. And here I'm just super gluing it over the uh, pegboard hole to help seal that and hide it. So here I just take my manhole cover, plop it right down onto the super glue, and I'm gonna squeeze it down and get it into place. Now the reason I've chosen the slick surface as the surface that I wanna glue all this to and actually use as the base side of the model is that it's really slick and I didn't want it sliding around on the game table. So since the underside, the back side is a little more textured, I decided that'd be the side that actually went onto the game surface. So here I've just got my little container of my 50-50 watered down Elmer's white PVA glue 
and a little bit of water and I'm just gonna brush on some of the glue. Now your end product for your uh, brushed on glue should be kind of a thin paste and should uh, ultimately not really puddle. It shouldn't run like a wash or like water. It should remain relatively where you put it. And then I just sprinkle on the uh, gravel mix I have. It's just a fine hobby sand from uh, Dollar Tree. And I just kind of pat it down and pat it into place, make sure I scoot it all the way in around the manhole cover. And after that, it's just a matter of waiting on it to dry. And one of the downsides about using PVA glue, especially watered down PVA glue, is it takes a very long time to dry. I ended up letting this sit overnight and then a little extra. So coming back later to a dried product, I just carefully lift up the edges. Uh, some of the glue kind of ran over, so I have to be real careful not to let it rip through or pull up the paper towel. And I want to keep as much of this over the paper towel as I can so I can reuse it later. So now I just take my time, completely wipe off and tap out all of the loose gravel that didn't stick down. I also want to make sure that I don't have any stuck to the top of the um, manhole cover. And I'm real rough with this. I just try and get as much of the excess off as I can. And I am, I'll go back on top of this and add another coat of glue to help secure it in place. Before I got too much farther though, I wanted to do a test, make sure I was still on the right path and that I had enough stuff to cover up the base and kind of make it a worthwhile piece of area terrain to have in the street. So here, as you can see, I've got my 2K rails and I've got a couple test models to show scale. What I decided on was that just the barricade itself wasn't quite enough. I also wanted to add some uh, shark's teeth tank trap type stuff which I've previously carved out of foam, made a silicone mold of, and then made a resin casting of. Uh, I created those the same way that I created the K-rails that I demonstrated though. Uh, same rock texturing technique, same method of getting the cuts and everything. So it's easy to reproduce using the same techniques. Uh, the coil of rope was made using um, um, Sculpey polymer clay. My girlfriend made that for me. Uh, she also made the uh, coil of rope as well as the head of the hammer that's going to be on here and a couple of the pop cans. That was all made using Sculpey. The barrel was made uh, in the same way that the uh, Koban barrels were. Uh, it's a cardstock that I made a mold out of using silicone and then uh, poured a resin casting of. And sometime I'll have to make a video demonstrating that. But honestly, it's a lot of hassle. And unless you're reproducing a lot of the same part over and over again, it may not necessarily be worth your time. So anyhow, this is kind of the configuration I ended up with. Uh, I decided I'm going to put a smoke cloud coming out of the barrel to make it look like there's been a fuel fire burnt in it, maybe uh, oil or something like that just burnt off. So there's going to be a nice billowy black cloud coming out of that that will be one of the later steps in the video. So anyway, let's uh, move on to the next step. So what I've decided to do next is uh, Mod Podge seal everything. And I do this with a mix of Mod Podge and black paint, uh, also known as Black Magic Primer. Uh, if you're familiar with Jeremy over at Black Magic Crafts, uh, this is uh, something that I picked up from him. Uh, he's a really good channel to watch if you uh, are into this sort of thing. He leans more towards the fantasy side of things, but he also does some sci-fi and uh, post-apocalyptic stuff that's pretty cool. But the idea behind this is it's a base coat you can see since the black paint's mixed in with the Mod Podge. And not only does it seal and harden things like this foam, it also lets you see where you've painted so you can make sure you've got the coat you want on it and you didn't miss anything. That's especially important later on if I want to spray paint any of this or if I want to um, use a spray sealer. Uh, you can get away without it and still spray paint foam, but it makes me feel a lot more comfortable and confident when I have to paint foam if I've sealed it like this. So just, I do all that uh, all the way across the board just so I have a similar working point to start with. I've also found that the uh, resin that I use for the resin castings, um, it's a lot easier to paint if I give it a base coat of this um, Mod Podge mix. It just the paint sticks to it a little better. So anyhow, now that I've got that done, the next thing I do is I take my watered down PVA and I use the brush and just water it down a little more. And then I'm gonna start just dripping that onto and kind of working it into the surface of 
the base itself so that asphalt that I put on there really sticks and stays and won't have any floating debris that just constantly gets knocked off of it. I probably could have done this with a spray bottle, but I didn't have one handy. The one I did have has froze up on me because I don't use it enough. So I just ended up putting it on with a brush. And just finishing up putting the last touches on that. Once I'm finished, I'm going to have to let all this dry overnight. Um, now the Mod Podge and this watered down PVA is going to be another overnight drying process. Um, I've heard you can speed this along by tossing it in the oven on a really low temperature like 170 or something. But I personally don't chance it. I just let it ride. So again, this is one of the reasons I like these uh, little... Um, these little samples for bases because on foam core or anything else this would probably really warp and on the um, tile it just didn't so I'm really happy with that and once it's all dried it's time to get started painting so here I have an apple barrel I believe um, country gray and I start with that as my base coat for all of my concrete just like I did on the Koban um, again use a big junk brush water it down so it flows nicely and then just uh, get started painting uh, I'm not very careful with this I just put on a base coat of this gray and then uh, once I got that on all the pieces I'll start moving on to the next step before moving on though I did want to point out that my base coat for my metallics which is the barrel I didn't use the gray for that instead I used black uh, again, this is terrain, so I'm not using any of my high-end acrylic paints for it. I'm using my hobby paints, the stuff I get at Walmart or Joann's or whatever for like a dollar for that big bottle you see there on the left. So here I'm just base coating or kind of repriming the barrel, which will be a metallic silver color when I'm done with it. So here you can see I'm uh, just putting the finishing touches on the base coat on the uh, barrel. This is uh, Folk Arts Brushed Silver, and I'm just gonna paint that on. It ends up taking two coats, but that's okay. Again, this is terrain, so I'm not using any of the uh, Games Workshop or Army Painters more expensive paints. I'm just uh, using the cheaper stuff for this. After everything's had a chance to dry, I come back in with a uh, Apple Barrel Rain Gray, and I'm gonna just dry brush this on real light. Um, so again, dry brushing is just, uh, you take your stiffer soft brush. In this case, I use a, I believe this is a eye highlighting brush, a makeup brush. Uh, you get a little paint on it, you wipe most of the paint off, and then you just brush across your surface, focusing on uh, going across the raised edges. And what this does is it picks out the paint on the uh, highest points of the model and peels the paint off onto those so what that does is it just creates that highlight and creates a little bit of texture in this case because again the aluminum foil texturing um, that i did will create sort of that uh, rock texture on this and so the high points in that texture are going to be what catches the paint off of the dry brushing so i just give all these a heavy dry brush and then once that's done we'll get started on the wash after everything's had a chance to dry from the paint, I go back over it with my homemade wash. This is just black hobby paint, um, a little bit of matte medium, a little bit of flow medium, um, and water to get the consistency I wanted. Uh, so maybe um, there's a bunch of videos on how to do that out there. I don't know that I'll ever get around to doing a video uh, of my own. It's not like my recipe is anything special. But anyway, I just give all of these a thick coat of this wash as you can see, that really brings out the texture in the concrete. And I really like the end product. I end up going back over this with a brown wash later, but that's part of the final product. And uh, I'll cover that when we get to it. But yeah, I just go over all this with this wash, put down a heavy coat of it. It doesn't matter if it pools, it'll just look like rainwater that pooled and left like the little tide rings from the puddles. So nothing to worry about there if that happens. Okay, now that we've got the majority of the bits painted, we can start gluing stuff down and get to work on the next uh, couple steps. So here I've got my dried base, I've got my dried parts, and I'm just trying to uh, put them up in the exact configuration I want. I kind of test with it a little bit, fiddle with it. After a couple different uh, configurations, this is the one I ended up on. This does a couple things for me. 
It puts the barrel that I'm going to have the smoke effect coming out of in the middle of the base or near the middle of the base. Uh, it leaves the manhole cover exposed, which I want to leave out there because I think it's a neat detail and I don't want to cover it up. And it gives me enough space to where there's still area to hide models both in and around the tank traps and on the backside behind the barrier itself. Uh, so here I'm just using on the foam pieces, I'm just using PVA glue. I can't use super glue on these because super glue will melt the foam. So uh, on the resin details though, I can use super glue and I just put a nice thick uh, blob on there because the uneven texture of the asphalt texture stuff underneath it doesn't grab very well to the smooth resin and I want to make sure that it's got a good chance to sink around and into those big chunks of rock. So here I'm back to the PVA and again I'm putting a pretty liberal amount on here. I'm putting a good glob on there so it'll have a chance to actually work down into the pavement surface and give it a chance to actually hold on. So I just do that to all my detail bits here. This is also the step where I glue down the unpainted detail bits like the coil of rope and the pop cans. I don't end up gluing down the hammer here because I haven't finished making it. I just have the head of it and I want to put it on a handle before I uh, get that attached. So anyhow, here I'm just attaching, I'm picking kind of random spots to do a few of these uh, cans and then we'll be moving on. Now we're coming up to one of my favorite features of this build and that is the smoke effect. Here I have some polyfiber um, material. It's normally used for like pillow stuffing and stuffed animals and stuff like that. Uh, it's very common to use for any kind of seamstressy type hobbies. Uh, so here I just uh, kind of get an idea how I want to shape it and start poking it in, make sure I can work with it. Uh, and here I'm going to just feather the top side out so I can get it all wispy smoke looking. Um, this is not the finished product, obviously. I'm going to end up painting this because I want it to be more of a blackened. And I make sure that I feather it out in both directions. I don't want it to just be kind of flat. So I feather it out and make it poofy in every direction and kind of wispy at the top, give it a few twists and kind of tear into it a little bit. So once I'm happy with that, it's time to move on to painting it. Now using Krylon spray paint, uh, flat or matte black, I'm just going to give the can a good shake and then uh, grab my piece of polyfill, make sure my can's not globby or anything, give it a good test spray. And once I'm happy with that, jump right in. And now I want it to be darker towards the bottom and lighter at the top. So here I'm just giving it a last bit of puffiness making sure it's as wispy as I want it and everything's going the direction I want. And the reason I'm doing this now and going over it is because as I spray paint it, that'll add a little bit of texture and hardness to it. So this is the time I wanna make sure it has the shape that I'm going for in the end result. So once I'm done with that, the next step will be to start spray painting it. And since I want it blacker, darker at the bottom, more thick, billowy, black, oily smoke, I start at the bottom and work my way out. And so, the top layers are just gonna get a light misting of the spray paint, but the bottom I'm gonna go over repeatedly. So as you can see, I'm focusing most of my spray at the bottom. I managed to mess and get this not quite in frame, but you can still see how I'm going about it. I'm kind of holding it at the bottom. Most of that that I'm actually holding, it's fine that it's not getting painted because it's gonna be down in the trash can, but I'm just carefully going over it and giving it a nice little upward spray so that the uh, bottom edge there and then the top is nice and light comparatively. The bottom edge I want to be really dark. So here you can see I'm even going over it again because it's it wasn't as dark as I wanted it to be. And while I was waiting on my smoke cloud to completely set up and dry and let that happen outside so the fumes had a chance to clear off, I decided this was the time to add the details and to uh, liven up the base itself a little bit more. So here I have one of the stickers I printed out on the Avery sticker paper. Um, I'm just carefully cutting down as much of the extra as I can because this will ultimately have a glossy finish that I don't really want. Um, it's inevitable using a sticker like this. I think I have a good idea for how to do this in the future. I just need to order some stuff and test it, but we'll see how that turns out. But for the meantime, I'm just trimming off all the excess uh, waste paper on this as I can. That way there's less of the glossy surface I have to co uh, cover up in the end. After I've got it prepped, I take the peeled sticker. I've got a spot picked out for it there on the 
uh, back side of the uh, barrier. So it looks like somebody tagged the barrier and I just squish it on there. I try to uh, press it in and make sure that it's really ad adhered to the uh, rock surface as much as possible. And then the next thing I'm gonna do is to make sure it's sealed and that it doesn't peel up, I'm gonna put a layer of uh, gloss varnish over it to help seal it down into place. Now this is gonna add to the glossiness in that area, but that's fine because I'm gonna go over the whole thing with a matte finish at the end and that'll help take the shine down off of it and make it blend in with the rest of the base a little bit more. Of course, once that's sealed, the next thing to do is to let it dry. So while that's drying, I'm gonna set it aside and I'm gonna start working on the hammer. So I've got the hammer head and I'm gonna pull out a paper clip and I'm gonna use my test model as a scale gauge to estimate the height of the uh, hammer's handle that I want. And once I've got that done, I'm gonna clip it off and then just use super glue to attach the uh, handle to the head. After giving the super glue a chance to dry, the next thing to do is to prime and start painting the hammer. So I just start with some Abaddon Black, some older uh, Citadel's uh, base paints that I had laying around. I, I don't really care about using these up. I've, used, I've moved on to using other paints primarily for model painting. And this is a good base paint uh, to use as a primer if I'm just brushing it on. So here, exactly what it says on the tin. I just brush on a layer of the base paint to prime it, uh, make sure I get the entire thing. Uh, the metal is a little rough to get uh, the paint to adhere to, so it may take a couple couple passes and I have to try and accelerate the drying by uh, blowing on it. It helps a little, but mostly it's just a pain and fiddly. I also decided I wanted a strip of danger tape to indicate that this was a an official barricade put up. So I've got this strip of paper I cut. This is just standard printer paper. It's a little on the heavier weight size. I think it's like 20 weight paper. But anyway, I've got some more uh, paint. I wanted a nice bright red, so I chose Evil Sun Scarlet. And I just carefully go over it, give it a nice even coat of paint. And uh, don't really waste too much time getting this perfect. Uh, it's going to be glued down and then washed over on top of. So it doesn't have to be fantastic. I just wanted that pop of color on the base to help it stand out. After getting the uh, caution tape or the danger tape painted, the next thing I went on to is painting the pop cans that are already glued to the base. So I decided one of them was going to be similar to the coffee can that I painted in the Koban build. So I'm using the same USA Tan Earth from the Flames of War uh, Vallejo uh, paint kit that uh, I purchased years back. So I do one of them that color and then I do the other one uh, Caledon Sky from Citadel. It's an older base paint. Uh, I just wanted to, again, give another pop of color to help it stand out and really kind of liven the base up a little bit. So once I've got that done, I move on to painting the uh, rope and I use just a yellow from Apple Barrel for that because it's one of the better yellows that I've, I've found because it's got a good thick consistency. Once the rope was painted, I moved back to the pop cans and I'm gonna do both ends of both of them with the same brushed silver that I used on the barrel. I just do a quick coat on either end and then once I've got that on there and I give it a chance to dry, I go back with a micron pin or a really fine tipped sharpie and uh, put the drink holes in either side. After that, I went back to the hammer. I decided I wanted to do the handle, a bright yellow uh, fiberglass style ham handle, which is common for modern uh, construction equipment and tools. So I just painted this a... Uh, bright yellow using the same yellow I used for the rope. I figured it would, wouldn't matter too much. I'm going to put a wash over both of them anyway, so it'll dampen it down just a little bit, bring out some of the definition and help tie it all together a little bit. This is uh, just again, it's going to be the uh, same yellow that I used for the rope. And then I'm going to paint the head of it with the same brushed silver that I've been using for the other metal effects. Now I've gone ahead and attached the hammer and uh, the piece of uh, warning tape. So the next thing I want to do is run over all of this with a brown wash to help tie it all together and help make it a little bit more weathered and give the base itself a little more depth. So I just, I'm going to use the same thing I used before, a homemade wash that's uh, made with brown ink, a little paint, some me matte medium and some flow aid. Again, it's nothing innovative or anything. It's just my own mix that I got to the consistency I like. So I just use my homemade brown wash and I go over the whole thing. 
With the base piece of the train all finished and painted, I've already given it a matte coat. I did that outside. I used the same process that I used for spray painting the uh, the uh, smoke cloud, really. Uh, just kept it at a safe distance, sprayed all over it. Uh, just kind of helped darken everything down. And this, as you can see, is how the um, how the smoke cloud itself turned out. I just take a little more time to put some more texture back into it. It kind of flattened out as I left it to dry. So. Um, the next thing I do is kind of get it puffed back out and then I just cram it back into the um, trash can with a bunch of PVA in there to help hold it all in place. I made sure that I put an abundance around the edges that way it would get all into the fibers and wouldn't just be on like the surface layer. So that's the key to this really is to make sure you get a nice thick coat in there. This is one of the few times you'll ever hear me say use thick coats of glue or paint, but just put a bunch of glue in there. Make sure that the uh, fibers get into the glue so it kind of seeps through it and it'll dry as one solid piece. So this is going to be a cool roadblock feature to add to the streets of Neo Nagoya, uh, which will help break up some of the big lines of sight. I really like the detail that got into it, and I like how cheap the product was, surprisingly. So if you liked the video, if you learned anything, if you enjoyed the journey, please give the video a like, share, subscribe. Uh, if you have any questions or anything, put them in the comments. I've been pretty good about getting to answer those. And here's some kind of sweeping shots of some of the completed Neo Nagoya stuff so far with the uh, roadblock included in it. I really like, like I said, how it breaks up the lines of sight for the long streets because that's going to be an issue for gameplay. So I'm really happy with how this has turned out. If you liked the content and you want to continue seeing more of it, please be sure to check out the possibilities for supporting us. You can check out our Patreon page, which is getting a revamp uh, coming over the next week so that by the uh, start of um, June, it's uh, going to be updated for some different content instead of the way it has been formatted. So that's going to be changing. Uh, we also have buy me a coffee if you'd like to tip us in the form of buying us cups of coffee. That would be very much appreciated. Uh, those are always nice. And of course, you can always buy the materials and the tools we use to create our stuff, uh, which you'll find in the Amazon affiliate links in the description below. Be sure to come back next time when we're going to be discussing and going over some uh, tips of 3D printing and some of the perks it has for a game like Seer where everything's customizable and you can run virtually anything. So 3D printing has really opened up a lot of doors in the forms of miniatures, models, and terrain that I can uh, have available all the time. And uh, I'm going to talk some about that and about uh, one trend that I'm seeing in particular in the uh, 3D printed um, Patreon creators, content creator side of things that I'm particularly happy with and looking forward to taking advantage of. So if you want to see that, like I said, make sure you hit the uh, bell notification on the channel. Make sure you like and subscribe to us. Come back and check that out next week. And a big thank you to everybody who's watched the videos so far and has enjoyed them and left comments. It's been great to hear some feedback and to see uh, what other people think of it. And I'm looking forward to continuing to bring out more content uh, on the Neo Nagoya project in particular. So remember, at the clock tower, it's always game time.